The pioneers of the Advent movement are not to be faulted. They're not to be ridiculed. They were doing what many honest, good people have been doing for centuries. They wanted Jesus to come in their day. So they looked for every evidence they could possibly invent, create, or find to show that the time was at hand. They're not to be faulted for that. Now the world ridicules and says crazy people believing the world was ending and you know, now the world plays these nasty games. The pioneers are not to be faulted but the pioneers are not to be taken as the last word. Now this is what happens in religious movements. Our Father said. This is exactly what they told Jesus. This is the card they played on Jesus. Mm -hmm. which, of the, which of the teachers, which of the rabbis, which of the elders have believed on this man? We look to the past and we hold these people up as our heroes and heroines and we say God used them and God blessed them and woe unto the man or woman that tries to go an inch further. It's nonsensical if you just stop to consider. It. It's nonsensical. There's some very interesting things that were said by our pioneers. Ellen White and uh, William Miller, who, by the way, was not an Adventist. He was a Baptist Christian. But these people arrived at a point in their own experience where they said, there is more, there is more, go on. Go forward, there is more. Now that doesn't work in real terms. The reason it doesn't work is, so you think you're smarter than the church leaders. That's the way the game is played. All right? This is what they pulled on John the Baptist. This is what they pulled on Jesus. This is what is done over and over and over again. God has not seen fit to give any man all the light. Did you hear what Jesus said to his own disciples? No man knows the day and the hour, not even the Son of Man. Mm. What kind of information was God withholding from his own Son? An understanding and knowledge of the time. Now time is very important. Timing is everything is the same. Time is very important. Why? Because if you think you know the time, the president is coming to visit or whatever it is, if you think you know the time, then in anticipation of that time, you're making arrangements. You're doing everything you can to be ready when that time, that person, that event, that whatever arrives. The timing issue is not to be discounted. It's important. Now God knows that. And God is not trying to play guess. I'll just leave them all guessing. That's not it at all. If Jesus said to Peter, Paul, James, and John and the eleven, go and preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I'll see you in a couple of thousand years. Is there anybody with a brain who thinks that those people would have left family, left nets, gone out, suffered persecution, everything that they went through, knowing that Jesus will be back in a couple of thousand years? I'm not that naive. I'm sorry. I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't think in those terms. I don't reason in those terms. And I think people who do reason in those terms are unreasonable. <laughs> God knows the human condition and he knows how we reason or don't reason. And for good reasons known only to God, he has chosen to hide this part of prophetic time from us, us, even we who 
could possibly be the last generation. So let's look at it. This is the part that is hidden. It's the measured days. Now I have here, didn't I put a new world order? Yes. And over here is the one world order. This is a progressive event, and it is an event made up of multiple events. But it is one event. And what is that singular event? It is Satan's, Lucifer's last chance to hold on to the land he's stolen. Because the express purpose of the judgment, I'm quoting Daniel chapter 7, the express purpose of calling the judgment into session is to take away his dominion. But the judgment shall sit and take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. There are large, large, large issues here. The judgment is going to be called in the session. Now, will it be one year in duration? Will it be three or three and a half? I don't know. I can't say. What I find in Daniel chapter 7 is that the beast is already in the mix. The lion, the bear, the leopard, all of these things are in the mix. There's a point in this prophetic time period in the which the beast is going to become uh, raging. He's already scary, but he is going to use, it says in the book of Daniel, his teeth and his nails to tear or rip apart the remnant, the residue. Those are the two witnesses. They are going to be murdered by the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. That's Satan, who is going to be loosed. And he knows that the express purpose of God in sending Moses and Elijah down here, miracles to work, sermons to be preached, the whole world to be like, Lucifer knows that they have come to do him in, to dispossess him. And so, as a roaring, raging lion, he is going to, in murderous rage, he's going to destroy anything and anyone who stands in his way. Now all you or I have to do to escape that rage is bow down. It's real simple. The story you'll find in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel. And the king commanded that an image should be erected in the plain of Dura. Did it have a head of gold? How much of it was gold? Head to toe. That's the proud, arrogant king who says, I'm not satisfied to be the head. I'm going to be everything or I'm going to be nothing. So, everyone is commanded to bow down. When the trumpets blast, bow down. It won't hurt. You'll get a little grass on your knees. It won't hurt. And of course, um, they say no. The three worthies say no. Now we all know the story. Do we understand Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were only representatives of the folk who live at the time of the end. Amen. What do you think Revelation 3 is about where, where God says through John to the churches, I know who they are, those who say they are Jews and are not. I know who they are. And because you have made me your God, your shelter, your secret place to hide, I will keep you in the hour of temptation, pardon me, that will come upon everyone in Louisiana. Yeah. 
So once again, this is where we want to focus for an hour, maybe two. I want to remove that from the image, back up, just to make sure we know where we are. Crisis number one. This one has to do with a monetary crisis. Crisis number two has something to do with a monetary crisis because this is where the high hopes of the new world order are dashed. The beast is wounded. Let's take a minute to talk about the wounding of the beast because the fathers, the pioneers thought, well, this is the Catholic Church and when the Pope's taken prisoner, that's the deadly wound and da da da. No, 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 no. The beast is a system that is born and is reared and lives at the time of the end. That's Bible. The beast is not from the past except something that we will come to if we have time. The beast represents a system. This is what Daniel is saying in chapter 7, his first vision. I saw a lion, I saw a bear, I saw a leopard, and then I saw a fourth beast. He was dreadful and terrible. He tore. He stamped. He did all these terrible things. But he is nothing compared to the image to the beast. In this one, he says to the world, not the world, he says to the kings who buy into it, the ten kings or ten parts, you bow down. This beast comes after this beast appears to have been rendered harmless. He receives a deadly wound. It's a wound unto death. And all the world wondered that this beast is resurrected and brought back to life. It is the Catholic Church. It is the papacy that will resurrect the first beast and say to the world, let's make an image of the first one except let's make it apply to, come on, the whole world. The whole world. And that will be the grand strategy. That will be the grand idea. Before we get there, the wounding of the first beast is the collapse of the monetary system that the beast system sets up. We call it the new world order. It's going to meet and appear to fall, collapse, even unto death, and not be breathed, breathing again. I put two to three years in here. I don't know how long this will be, a year, whatever, doesn't matter. There's approximately three years and three and a half, all of which can be reckoned and reasoned to be seven last years. Now. There's a difference between this crisis and this one. This one is bringing in prosperity, kicking the can down the road. Here, that prosperity is vanishing, melting away. The end of all their bright dreams, Ellen White says in Great Controversy and Delusive Hopes. Struggle in vain, she says, to place business operations on a more secure basis. So two to three years, I believe that this one, two to three years is the time you and I better be working, better be witnessing, better be doing anything and everything we can do in the cause of present truth, in the cause of Christ, in the cause of sanctuary truth and enlightenment. This is our time. This is it. Now I'm not going to tell you where I'm going. And no, it's not Alaska. Will it be wrong to run and hide? Come on. Not if the work is what? Done. Not at all. Well, let's talk about this third crisis right here. 
whatever it is, it changes the way heaven does business. Heaven is going to be so moved by whatever this crisis is that's going to come that God is going to tell how long it's going to take till the end. You're going to have to think on that one a while. So what is going to be the difference from this side of the line to this side of the line? This time is indistinct. It's measured, but it's indistinct. In other words, I don't know if it's 365 days a year or 360 days a year. I suspect, this is personal, I suspect that everything on this side of crisis number three will be based upon a calendar of 365 and a quarter days per year. I just suspect that. Because these are measured days, 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years or times and so forth. Because these are measured times, they fit sanctuary reckoning, sanctuary time. This is nebulous. This is not. This is clearly tied in some way to sanctuary timing. So here's the way it worked. This is the way it's going to work. The children of Israel are in Egypt. They did not know who they were. They did not know there was any purpose in their existence. They did not remember granddaddy or great granddaddy or great great granddaddy. God had to send Moses out of retirement to tell them, you know, our fathers, your fathers, God spoke with in person and promised them. They didn't know who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were. How many years were they in slavery down in Egypt? 400 plus years, it says. What would they know? What would they comprehend? Next to nothing. So God has to begin making them aware that a holy purpose, a holy purpose is working in your generations. Even Moses had to receive instruction along those lines. So he's out, he's just found a shady spot under a rock or under a bush or something and he's letting the sheep and the goats ramble around and do whatever. And over there's a bush and it's on fire. Hmm, hadn't been any lightning today, what's going on? And he sits there and it keeps burning and it keeps burning and it keeps burning and he says, I've got to go find out what's going on here. This bush is burning but it's not being burned up. Now tell me, you know this story, but do you really know the story? Tell me what happened as Mo Moses approached the burning, non-burning bush. A voice spoke to him out of the bush. And what did the voice say? Now isn't that a strange kind of a story? I mean... The sand is hot, guys. I mean, uh, why do I want to take my sandals off? The bush is hotter. Loose your shoes from off your feet because you are standing on hot sand. No, 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 no. What did it say? You're standing on holy ground. All right, now I want to know what made that piece of ground different than that piece of ground. Wherever God is. Exactly. Nothing is holy unless God is touching it. That's why you don't touch the ark, boys. It's called electrocution. Now, holy ground 
Moses, I have a job for you. And the job is go and tell my people, go and tell your people that I'm going to bring them out with a strong arm. I'm going to bring them out of slavery, out of Egypt. And I'm going to bring them to where we're we going. I mean, if you're going to leave town, you've got to go somewhere. Where are we going? I'm going to bring you to the land, I swear, unto your fathers. Now, we have a term for that land. We call it the promised land or the promised land. Okay? Now, here's what was not said. Are you ready? Snakes, scorpions, hot, cold, Texas. tired, hungry. <clears throat> Moses, we didn't bargain for this. This is not how we worked it out. You brought us out here to do what? Now listen to the desperation. We wish we had stayed in Egypt. At least we had what to eat? Garlic. Now you know they were desperate. I mean, a little garlic is okay. But you're so far out in nowheresville that even garlic sounds good. The manna was... Smells good. What? Oh, they didn't have the manna yet. No, no, they had to be hungry before manna. That's down the road a little while. No, 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 no. Where were they going? To the promised land. How many of them made it? How many years were they for the two to get there? Now listen, if you leave Egypt and you're going to get to Palestine, we call it, the Holy Land, the whatever, whatever, do you know just walking how quickly you can get there? In three weeks, three and a half weeks. That's all. What's the 40 years all about, guys? I'm ears. I'm ready. Somebody's got to make sense out of all of this. What? Well, it's real easy to put it all off on the people. They did it. They did it. They didn't do it. I'll tell you what I think, guys. It was going to be 40 years no matter what they did or didn't do. I'm sorry. I think there's going to be 6,000 years no matter what they do or don't do. I don't think there's anything about time that sneaks up on God. At all. I think God knows. Now let's say it again. Bad stuff pays off fast. Good stuff takes forever to pay off. Are you listening? I mean, we're talking real life. We're talking about real life on this real rock. <clears throat> Is the wicked enjoy life while the righteous wonder why the wicked have it so good? Well, this is all going to change. What we have to do is come to a certain point where we change the clock, where we change the calendar. You see, Moses and the children of Israel left Egypt, got to the mountain about 90 days down the road, got to the mountain. Three months down the road, got to the mountain. And God sent a message down to, Mo to Moses saying, come up here. We're going to have a conversation. To bring a writing pad with you.
And so this is our first record, written record, known record of God's Ten Commandments, Ten Commands, Ten Words, whatever you want to label, put on it. Come up here and we're going to talk. So God gave the Ten Commandments and then He explained the next part of the plan. What was the other part of the plan? I'm going to give you a plan so that you can build, construct what? A sanctuary. Let them make me a sanctuary. Now what was the stated purpose of the sanctuary? That I may dwell among them. But he had given the law and now he is telling Moses and the children of Israel how the law is going to be placed within the temple, the sanctuary, the house. Is it given a prominent position? Come on, the Ten, ten Commandments, the tables of stone, where were they to be placed? In the outer court? No. In the first apartment? No. Were those significant places? Yes. Yes. But whatever the Ten Commandments represent, they are in a holier place. What makes something holy? God does what? Touches it. Who wrote it? Did Moses write it? And you're going to put it in a box. And you're going to put it in the most sacred apartment of the plan. Now the way this plan works is this. From the garden to the cross, the sanctuary is being worked. It's working. From the cross until Jesus comes, the sanctuary is working. But here, it is a different work than here. Which part of the sanctuary is in effect here? Come on. The outer court and the first apartment. What happens here takes place in the second apartment. It is referred to as the Holy of Holies. It's not just a holy place. It's the Holy of Holies place. We, we need to make it simple, but understand how profound what we're talking about really and truly is. So where were the commandments to be placed? Here or here? Come on. In the Holy of Holies. So if this represents 6,000 years, where can we expect the Ten Commands of God to be brought to view? Come on. Were they brought to view in the time of Moses and the children of Israel? What would keep them hidden from view? They were placed where? In a box. Overlaid with gold and lidded, topped with pure gold. All right? Now, why would you put it in the box? Safekeeping. You didn't need to worry about it. Nobody was going to grab it and get by with it. So, that it wasn't for quotes, safekeeping. It was there for a time and a purpose. I submit to you that this is the time and the purpose will be made known and seen and demonstrated to the whole world. The man of sin is re referred to as the lawless one. Lawless. God is going to make a demonstration to the whole world and to heaven that there is a law. 
It's as sacred as himself. It is as immovable and untouchable as himself. It will be brought to view. You can read about it in Revelation. At a certain point in time, and the ark of his testament was open in heaven. All of this is part of this story, whatever this story represents, whatever it is. We have to have a change in time. Why? Because in the days of Moses and the Exodus, the calendar basically worldwide, and that has been demonstrated in history, the calendar of that time, this time right here, was 300 and 60 days a year. The earth went all the way around the sun in almost a perfectly circular orbit. 360 days. Now that works nicely. If it's not 360 days and it gets out of kilter, it doesn't work nicely. So what would lead a person to think that since Moses and Hezekiah and Isaiah, when a change occurred in the cosmos, something happened overhead. Have you read this? If something is doubled in Scripture, what does that mean? Because the thing was doubled unto the king, it is therefore certain. Well, what if it's trebled? What does that mean? Have you, you guys, you never have gotten into any of this? Mark wrote the first gospel. Matthew borrowed from Mark. John didn't borrow from Matthew or Mark. He was the youngest. He was the last. He was, he was, and he wasn't. The third gospel writer was Luke. Luke was a Gentile. Luke was a Johnny come lately. Luke was not a first person witness. He went around interviewing those who were first person witnesses. And so isn't it interesting, it is to me, that you have the record of Matthew, which is the record of Mark, and the record of Luke is the record of Matthew and Mark. And you have three accounts of Jesus on the mountain with the disciples saying, this is what the end will be like. Three times it's trebled. Three times, three times. Listen, whoa. The calendar was 360 days. By the time we get to Isaiah and Hezekiah, Isaiah is the prophet, Hezekiah is the king. And uh, they're about to be done in. Who's coming? The Assyrian, Sennacherib, and his army. Now there's a period of, some believe, 12 to 13 years in here from the first time to the last time Sennacherib's army shows up. Okay? That's not, that's not strange in history because things happen. And so you may not be there two years and you may come back on the fifth year, you may whatever. So there's 12 to 13 years or so in between the first surrounding of Jerusalem and finally the devastation that takes place or was to take place. Do you know how finally Hezekiah was spared and the residents, the, the people hiding and the great walls around Jerusalem, how they were spared. Yes. The Assyrian armies had completely circled the city. Completely. They had thrown sieges, siege, siege walls up against the walls, outside walls of Jerusalem. They were ready to batter the walls down and finish the job. And uh, according to the record in Isaiah, 
or Kings or Chronicles. There were at least 185,000 Assyrians. I'm not so sure those numbers are exactly correct. It doesn't matter. There was a bunch of them. And they were bad guys. If you knew the history of the Assyrians and how they treated people, I mean... Anyhow, they have come to finish the job. And it is midnight. Are you listening? It is a specific hour. It is at midnight. In a jubilee year. How do we know it was a jubilee year? Because in the seventh year, the Jews didn't plant. In the seventh year, which is the 49th, and the 50th year, which is Jubilee, they don't plant for two years in a row. And the Bible record is, they did not plant for two consecutive years. So let's see if I've got this straight. What is about to take place is happening at midnight in a Jubilee year. Now tell me what happened. Come on. What happened to spare the Jews, the Hebrews? God rained down hot rocks out of heaven upon them. And how many it says? And 185,000 of them woke up in the morning and they were all dead. That's how the Baptists found out you were still alive after you died. Are you listening? Is there anything about this experience that we really need to know that we haven't mentioned yet? And here it is. What brought the hot rocks down out of the sky at just the right time? It was the passing over. It was pass over. It was pass over at midnight. That's the Exodus all over again, guys. It was pass over at midnight in a jubilee year. And the hot rocks came down out of the sky. Well, why did it kill all of them and didn't kill all of them? Because these guys had blood over the door. And these didn't. You need to think long and hard about some of these accounts. You need to think, why? Why is this being doubled? Because this is a repeating of the Exodus event. Not precisely, not exactly, but enough is being repeated that we need to say, wow, something is going on here. Let me tell you what was going on here. Whatever was passing over in the heavens, whatever was passing over came near enough and was massive enough to throw the rocks down and to grab this little rock that we live on and pull it, elongate its orbit, plus three and a half or a quarter days. Five and a quarter, I'm sorry, I got the three and a half and the five and a half. Five and a quarter days. And so, once things settle down, shifting around, once things settle down, everybody had to write a new calendar. Everybody had to draw up a new calendar. Some people, the his, historical record shows that some people were alert enough to things in the heavens that they sorted it out in two to ten years. Pretty quickly they figured out you got to add to the calendar. Some folk took 20 to 22 years to work it out. I think they lived in Alabama but I'm not sure. <laughs> well, why is this a problem? I mean, just because Moses received the law when it was 360 days on the calendar, what difference does it make? Because Moses, not Moses, 
Isaiah and Hezekiah lived about what time B.C.? Come on. About 700 B.C. Daniel didn't come along until what time? Another hundred years. And Daniel is given visions. Visions of what? Shut up the words and seal the book even till the time of the when knowledge will be increased. So what we have is 360 days, 365 and a quarter days, and something happens in the book of Daniel, and we're back to 360 again. How do we know that? Because this is easily seen in 1260, 40 and two months, and on and on and on. Besides that, in the first king given, first dream given to King Nebuchadnezzar. What did Daniel say to the king? For he will what? Change what? The times and the seasons. Whatever the time of the end is about, God is going to reset the clock. So this can come to pass as written, as predicted, as promised. All right. Let's talk about what could possibly happen right here. Well, there could be a flyby. There could be a change in the times and the seasons. One word that could be supplied right there is moed. There will be a change in the moed, which is rendered in your English Bible as times and seasons. Is there anything in the New Testament, in the words of Jesus, that suggests there may be a flyby in the heavens at the beginning of this time. What? Come on, guys. Come on. I know it's been a long day. had not been that long. <laughs> come on. Who's talking? Jesus is talking. And it's Luke 21. That's where you want to go. Luke 21. Now you see Matthew and Mark share exactly the same list or, or catalog of events that are going to transpire. Wars, rumors of wars, famine, pestilence, earthquakes, all these things. Same, copy for copy, verbatim. When you get to Luke, Luke does exactly famine, pestilence, earthquakes, war, nation against nation, all of this. And when you get to verse 11, chapter 21, Luke, verse 11, Jesus said, and fearful sights. Fearful, that's a compound word. It's a shortened compound word. Full of fear sights shall appear in the heavens. I submit to you that there's an object that is going to come near enough, is going to be large enough in the heavens and massive enough in the heavens to change the calendar, to move us in our orbit. If the flyby occurred in the days of Hezekiah and Isaiah and our orbit was elongated, if the object comes back the opposite direction, like so, I should have drawn that this way, like this, it would retrograde. It could retrograde our orbit. The calendar that the world observes belongs to whom? The calendar that the world observes belongs to whom? The Vatican. It belongs to the Catholic system. If something should happen in the heavens, to alter the calendar. Whose responsibility would it be to give us a new calendar? 
Don't say the Mormons. <laughs> Who's response? Who would the world look to for such information? Now, if you're going to start tinkering with the calendar, what danger is there? What an excellent opportunity to set the record straight. We have decided this is the seventh day. Are you listening? You get the drift. You understand. And, of course, you are all going to go downtown, stand on the streets, and wave placards saying, we protest. <laughs> we don't like it. You will be looked at as what? Come on. Troublemaker. Rabble rouser. Unfeeling. Uncaring. Not respectful of the Holy See of Rome. I don't recommend placards, guys. Trouble will come, I'm quoting, trouble will come soon enough. If we have a flyby in the heavens, and that's, um, to me, that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, in fearful sight shall there see, be seen in the heavens. All these are the beginning. Somebody, something is going to happen to redraw and rewrite the calendar. And that is not something you want or I want. Especially if you've already been keeping the Sabbath for, you know, a hundred plus years or whatever, you, you, this is the way you reckon it, read it, do it, practice it. And now, an act of God has changed everything. You know what the Catholic Church can say? We didn't do it, guys. God did it. You know what an act of God is? All right, we want to move. Anything that comes this near our rock and has enough mass to shift us in our orbit is near enough So Jesus said to the disciples, this is how you can know. Every stone that you see down there will come down. That's what he said. I'm not making anything up. Every stone will come down. Not one left standing atop another. Has that ever happened? No, it hasn't. There are still several hundred and maybe hundreds of those original stones from the temple they were looking at that day still standing. Part of it is called the Wailing Wall. Those are original stones from the days of. All right? So anything that comes near enough is going to take down Jerusalem. By the way, Daniel chapter 9 says, and when the command shall go forth to restore and rebuild what? Jerusalem. Why would you restore and rebuild Jerusalem? <laughs> because it's been shaken down. That's why. Now listen. Listen. What we have are some wild people on this planet. Wild people. Those are not my words. Those are the words in the book. 
and he shall be called a wild man. He won't get along with his brothers and he won't get along with his neighbors. Was there ever a better description? We have some wild people on this planet. And they are watching day and night, watching, watching, watching those rocks on that hill in that town of Jerusalem. You can't hardly call it a city. They are watching. And should anything ever occur that would upset their ordered affairs, um, they would not be happy campers. I don't know how else to say it. I believe every Muslim, especially radical Islamists, on this planet will be ready to march on Jerusalem. For what purpose? Come on, for what purpose? To keep the Jews from seizing it. I don't think I'm too far out of line here. To keep the Jews from seizing what? The Temple Mount. And as they are coming, waves of them are coming. The Jews who are measured only in the few millions over there, three and a half million Jews. The few Jews who were there are going to look at a large lion's share of 1.3 billion wild men coming their direction. Now, if you were a Jew, what would you do? Hop the next flight out. <laughs> Never look back. No, that's not the way it works. Because when they outlived Hitler and the terrible things that happened back there in the Holocaust years. By the way, you'll want to uh, sometime just kind of get a calendar and figure out how much time transpired from the time they started rounding up the Jews until they were liberated. I won't say anything about three and a half years. Not a thing. If you were a Jew and there were three and a half million of you and there was 70 million coming in your direction, um, what would you do? So I'm going to make a wild, wild suggestion that the Jews are going to pull the trigger on one or more nuclear weapons and Damascus will be no more. Why is Damascus part of this picture? Because they all have to funnel through Damascus to get to Jerusalem. The Bible predicts it. Yes, of course. More than once. Yes. Now, if you were enjoying your your um, day in New York City and uh, suddenly you hear that the Jews, the Hebrews, the Israelites have used nuclear weapons to halt the hordes of Islamic radicals who are coming. Um, what would you do? I mean, if you were sitting comfortably in New York City, what would you do? Well, uh, send my secretary in, please, and I'd like to do a letter to so-and-so. No, 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 no. No, that's not the way the story will be written or told. The whole world will take a breath. <sighs> and hold it until they turn blue. 
Now you've got to pin the blame somewhere. Where are you going to pin the blame? Never on the Jews. Of course, that's where you pin the blame. Never on the guys who are coming to kill them. Never, never, never. Look, this is why when you read Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, if you'll read it carefully, you will find Jesus saying, And great wrath shall there be against this people. And ye shall be hated of all nations. And some of you, they're going to kill. The United Nations will not even have time to call for an emergency session. Just whoever is there, stand up, hold your breath, take another breath, and scream all at once. The Jews did it! And so there will be one way and only one way out of what is about to happen. Because the allies of the Islamists are China and Russia. And the allies of the Israelis are the Americans. And so the Americans will be ready to push their button and the Chinese and the Russians will be ready to push their buttons. And the air will be so tense globally. The atmosphere will be so intense that you could cut it with a knife. And everyone recognizes that we are one button away from eternity. Come on, one button away. So what is the world going to do to keep the next button from being pushed? Come on, come on. You're looking for anyone that could possibly defuse this situation. What's his name? Papa. El Popo. Yeah. The Pope. He's the only man on the planet that will not look like Swiss cheese before morning. Absolutely. We're talking about global realities. Now, we have a mystery at this point. And here it is. Two angels are talking. This Daniel chapter 8. Two angels are talking one to the other. One is uh, the number of secrets or the secret numberer. And there's another angel and they are talking between themselves. And one asks the other, how long shall it be Till. That's the question everybody wants to know. How long shall it be till the abomination that maketh desolate is set up and the abomination and so forth? Here we come with the Vatican at the center of global politics, global view, global discussion, global, global. This is the man and the only man that we know who can save the world from certain destruction. And he's going to say, peace, peace, we're all brothers. Let there be peace. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with that. But there's something else that's going to happen. Because if you look right here, money, more money, big money. This is how you talk about the image to the beast because this one was wounded unto death. Any money, any economy, anything 
that was in place here. When this crisis occurs, every stock market on the rock just went to nothing. Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> I mean, set off a small nuclear weapon and all the markets are going down. This is going to be a big event. This is going to be an earth-shaking event in more ways than one. How are we going to solve the immediate crisis and how are we going to bring in the everlasting thousand years of peace? Have you ever seen the inside at which they have been showing on television on the History Channel? Have you ever seen the tour through one a Vatican vault? One Vatican vault. It is gold, it is gold, it is gold, it is gold, there is gold. Where did they get all the gold, guys? They stole it! You see in Revelation 17, when you get the Vatican into the picture, She's dressed like a woman with pearls and gold cups and chalices and she's got everything that the kings of the earth wish for, want for, hope for. And right here, right here, I guarantee you, she will throw her vaults open and say, we have a one world order and we will take the power of our wealth to stand behind a new currency and a new calendar and new rules and a new world. We will back it up. She's the only power on the planet that can do it. She doesn't have to take one ounce of her gold out. All she has to do is show the world. That's all. Talk about a dream. And the world will love her. We're talking about power politics at their best and their worst. We have a crisis that is literally going to melt down everything and everybody on the planet. And the Vatican is in position to defuse it. It's a dream. You can't write the, the script. You can't write a better script than this. Everything is going to take place to cast the papacy, the, quotes Holy See of Rome, in the best possible light. And do you think she's not going to play it to the hilt? This is a daydream. This is a dream. This is, this is, you couldn't write a better script if you tried. So what will follow in the three and a half years? Uh, prosperity or step by step by step by step. They will put together the one world order, the new system, the new plan so that the businessmen of the earth can prosper, the governments of the world can prosper, the people of the world can prosper, and everything would work great if it weren't for that crazy bunch of Adventists. Or whoever stands up to the... We will be despised. We will be hated. We will be hunted down. So the mother of James and John got up next to Jesus and said, uh, I'd like to have a word with you, Master. 
when you come into your kingdom, and we know you're coming into your kingdom, when you come into your kingdom, I would like for one of my sons to sit on the left and one of my sons to sit on the right. And Jesus' response was classic. Do you remember what he said? He said, woman, what? You don't know what you're asking. Nevertheless, nevertheless, nevertheless. Look, folk, there's going to be plenty of witnessing in this time. How much of it will be standing in the street and giving away a book? I'm not real sure. I like the way Ellen White covers this territory. She says the books that were sown by missionary workers will have completed their task. Lines have been drawn. Decisions have been made. And many who will take a stand for the truth in that day will trace their first impressions to powerful stuff. Powerful, powerful stuff. Look, three and a half years is a long time. I don't know if I'll survive that. I don't know. That's not the issue. What I can know is that if I put my trust in God, I will survive what? All that the enemy has wrought, not only in my day, but in every day, all that the enemy has done, God will undo it. So let me ask you this in simple, straightforward terms. If you take a stand for God, for Christ, for the truth, when that time comes, is there a distinct possibility you will lose your life? Yeah. <clears throat> now, if you don't take a stand for God and for Christ and for truth, is there a distinct, no, not distinct, is there a sure probability you will lose your life? And what else will you lose beside your life? Your soul. Eternal life. That's, I mean, you've got your choice of dying or dying. How's that? It's not exactly the way we'd like the script to be written. But uh, let's try and tell it in this way. A lot of people, and maybe some of you, believe that God is all-powerful. Nothing can get in God's way. He's too big, He's too wise, He's too powerful. With God, all things are what? Possible. But not all things are probable. Here's the picture from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. Don't miss it. When Adam and Eve sinned, God could have turned His back and walked away. God could have reasoned, I told them, I warned them. They wouldn't listen. They didn't listen. They're going to have to pay. You play, you pay. Now what was the problem? What would have kept God from reasoning and behaving in exactly that manner? Come on. What's the word? Four letter. It's a four letter word. Love. Love. God, as a loving parent, could not allow His children to pay for their foolishness, for their ignorant, ignorant stupidity. God could not allow them. If there was anything at all He could do about it, He was going to do it. So this is the way I would have worked it out. 
you know, I'm, 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 call me Job. This is the way I would have worked the problem out. Now, Lord, seeing the end from the beginning, and you can. I think you should make a speedy work of solving this problem while there's only two people around. Think of all the pain that could be saved, all the misery that could be spared. Think of all the bad that could never come to pass if you'll just go on and get this thing taken care of. So tell me why God didn't nip it in the bud. The record is he was not even standing there saying, Eve, don't touch that. I told you don't touch that. He didn't do it. Tell me why not. Come on. Because if he had interfered in their free choice, they were never free. Does that make any sense to anybody? That was Lucifer's claim in heaven. You say you made us to be free spirits. Oh no, we have to jump when you say jump. We have to say yes when you say yes. I submit to you that sin tied God's hands. This is demonstrated all the way through Old and New Testament Scripture. When they came to take Jesus in the garden, He put His hands out to be tied. There was Abram or Abraham who was a type of God, type of Christ. There was Isaac. And Isaac needed a wife. And Abram sent his servant off to find a wife for Isaac. What was her name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Do you know what her name meant? Her beauty will bind to you. Sin has tied God's hand. Oh, impossible. You can't tie God up. Sin tied him up. Love is God's weakest link. Love says to God, let them spit on you. Let them slap you in the face. Let them call you every dirty name in the book. And we'll find out if you really love. We'll check this love stuff out. See, no, 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 no. Sin, evil, bad things produce almost instant gratification. If I steal your purse and get all your money and your credit cards, it's instant gratification. Bad produces instant gratification. But doing good things takes a long time to produce fruit. This is the source of several of the Psalms that David wrote. Lord, I don't get it, he said. I don't understand it. Why do the wicked prosper? Because you and I want God to take care of business right now. And I submit to you that He cannot do so and be a God of love. He can't. So yes, you and I are waiting down here and waiting down here and waiting down here and enduring down here and yes, yes, yes. But who has been waiting longer than you and me? Who feels every pain? Not just yours. Who hears every cry, not just yours? God's hands have been tied for 6,000 years. What happens here is that
we're going to see God, Ellen White explains, God will take the reins into his own hands and make a speedy work. I like that. I don't like riding horses, but I like that. God takes some reins and makes a speedy work. That's what happens in this three and a half years. Once again, it is impossible to describe the experience of God's people when the persecutions of the past and the mighty workings of His Spirit are blended. We're going to see miracles. At the same time we're going to see miracles, we're going to see some of God's people, many of God's people, persecuted, even put to death. How do you cope with that? How do you or I cope with that? Words, courage, words will be given you, which none can gainsay nor resist. Miracles will be wrought. We are going to see God do things that His hands are now free to do. But we have to cooperate with heaven. We have to. And here's why. When the judgment is called into session in heaven, and that's what's coming, the hour of His judgment is come. His judgment. In the sanctuary, it is the Lamb that is judged, examined. In the sanctuary, it is the high priest that is judged or examined. Jesus, whether the Lamb or the high priest, is the one who is examined. Will the court find him worthy as a lamb and as a priest? Come on. Will the court find him guilty or worthy? Come on. What does it say? Worthy. Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive what? Glory, honor, majesty, power, dominion. All the things that have been withheld from him, that he surrendered, are going to be appointed him, appointed unto him by the court of heaven. Now, Daddy could get it for him. But God's too wise. Too wise. So, God's hands are going to be freed. Why is this necessary? Here it is, and don't miss it if you get nothing else out of the day. When the court is called into session, it's all about the law. It's all about the law. And so the question will be posed to the court. Um, has anyone kept the law? That was Lucifer's claim. Nobody can keep that law. So the question is posed to the court. Has anyone kept the law? The lamb. He has kept the law. Does he declare that? In the New Testament, does he declare that? I have kept your law. I have. Okay? Is that wonderful? Oh, is that wonderful? If he had failed in even a single point, you and I would be without hope, without help, without a Savior, without eternal life, without anything, if he had failed. So he kept the law. Was it a wonder, wonderful, wondrous event? Yes. Was it a marvelous event? Yes. And then someone says, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the court, and angels in the court, in 6,000 years, you've got one person who can keep the law? One person? And by the way, he kind of had a silver spoon in his mouth. You've got one witness. And I believe from the throne the answer will come something like this. No, I have many witnesses. And there will be many who will be obedient even unto death. 
Now the 144,000, I believe, are the witnesses that God needs. I didn't say wants. Of course He wants witnesses. Of course He does. But God needs witnesses. He needs mortals, human beings, human beings who have sinned and know what it is to struggle against unrighteousness and against evil. God needs witnesses. This is what Jesus said, and it shall turn to you for a witness then. Amen. And ye shall be loved by all nations, loved by all men. No, ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. The 144,000 are the witnesses that God needs to close the court down. One thing is lacking. They lack one thing. The 144,000 are all, were all sinners. And if you sin, you die. But we're talking about 144,000 that escape death. And I want to know how that is possible. Everybody else has to pay the price. How is it that they escape? Because while they are being tested and tried, Jesus stands in the holy place and says, He that is righteous... We're talking about people who are doing righteousness, performing righteousness, living as best they know how to the will of God, the Word of God, the law of God. Let him that is righteous be righteous. What? Still. What does still mean? From now on. From this point on. And let him that is unrighteous be unrighteous. What? Still. So how can the 144,000 in that moment escape death? Because Jesus will blot out their sins as though they had never, what? Come on. Sinned. This is what the blotting out is all about. This is what the disciples thought was happening on Pentecost back there. That's what Peter said. And this is that which was spoken of by Joel the prophet. Be sure that you confess your sins and break off your sins because what? Come on. The time has come for your sins to be what? Blotted out. That has never happened in the history of sin in mankind. God has not yet blotted out sin. That is what takes place here. That is what takes place here. Here, the blotting out of sin. Right here. Do you know what the word concurrent means? It's two or more things taking place at the same moment and time. All right? You see, in Revelation 14, there are three mighty angels. Do you understand that the word angel does not mean pink wings? Do you understand that? Do you understand that that's Middle Ages stuff and vivid imagination stuff and whatever? So I saw, listen to John, I saw three mighty angels flying in the midst of heaven. Well, is that the heaven up yonder, the heaven between, or down here? And there were three of them. And they are preaching to every kindred, tongue, nation, and people, it says. Now this is the way that happens with radio, television, and internet. Those are the three Witness it. If you want to put it into. Now, 
Moses and Elijah are two of those mighty witnesses. No question in my mind about that. But it says there are three. So tell me who got to heaven before Moses and Elijah. Enoch. Thank you. His name was Enoch. He got there not long after Adam and Eve and whatever. He was said to be the seventh from Adam. Now he's been on a long vacation, guys. You can't be there for nothing, no purpose, no reason. So if you want to do yourself a favor and find an interesting reading, and it's only a paragraph or two, get 7a of the Bible commentary and get the E.G. White comments on Revelation 18, 1 to 4. Just, it's not hard to find. And she talks about that other mighty angel that will lighten the whole world with the glory of his message. Now this is how it reads. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. All right? Come out of her. How did they become part of the system? Because they just reasoned taking the number and going along with the plan was the thing to do. Is there any indication, both in Scripture and certainly in the writings of Ellen White, that they're going to come out? Many of them are going. They took the number and will give it back. I think Enoch is that third witness. That's what I think. How do? Why would I think that? Because Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. Come on, what did he prophesy? The Lord comes with ten thousand of His saints to execute. Justice, mercy, liberty, all those things. I believe Enoch is that third great witness. Otherwise, I don't think he deserved that long vacation. <laughs> so I cannot predict and you cannot predict who in this place could be among those who live through. I don't know. I can't. I can't. But Ellen White makes this statement. There's a time coming when we will know who they are. Wow. Oh, wow. That one, that's kind of scary to me. Because if I know, I may not see myself in that mirror. I may not. Never know. Never know. Now, I've got to show you this before I let you go. I shouldn't, but I'm going to. This is the council in the red books. Leave the large cities. It didn't say leave all cities. It said leave the what cities? Large. Let's define that a little better. The time is near when the large cities will be visited by the judgments of God. In a little while, these cities will be terribly shaken. This was written 150 years ago. 100, easily 125 years ago. You'll find it in the little compilation called Evangelism. I would highly recommend that you get a copy of that. ABC has it. We call it a red book. 1903. She's just returned from Australia three years before. 1903. Ere long there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them, come on, will not be able. What does that tell you is going on in these cities that you can't get out? Come on. Martial law. We must be preparing for these issues. This is the light given to me. 
If, that's the largest word in the dictionary, right there. If in the providence of God, we can secure places away from the cities, the Lord would have us do this. There are troublous times before us. Just a few of these, only a few, and there are pages and pages of them. Uh, a friend sent me this by email. I told you earlier there are people that are always sending me something. Brother Wheeling, I uh, saw this and thought of you. Can you see that? How old is this? Two weeks. Here's the headline. Why are thousands of millionaires fleeing Chicago and other major cities around the world. This is two weeks, two weeks ago. This is the article, just a little bit of it. The elite, that means folks with money. The elite are fleeing major cities around the globe at a staggering rate. In fact, the Chicago Tribune is reporting that approximately 3,000 millionaires left the city of Chicago during 2015. If millionaires are leaving, what are they taking with them? Their, their dough, their taxes, their... 3,000 in one year out of Chicago. The same study discussed in that Chicago Tribune article found that 7,000 millionaires left Paris, France last year. So why is this happening? Why are thousands of millionaires suddenly packing up and moving away from the big cities? Could it be possible that they have many of the same concerns that preppers do about what is coming? For quite a while, I've been writing, the, the author says, I've been writing about how the elite have been preparing for the coming collapse, but I had no idea that literally thousands of them are packing up and permanently leaving our major cities. Major cities. As I mentioned above, the Chicago Tribune is reporting that about 3,000 of them left the city of Chicago alone in the previous calendar year. Now what I've done here is just put two or three paragraphs out of three pages in this article. You can go online, find it easily enough. Millionaires leaving large cities. Actually, the two cities that lost the most millionaires last year are both located in Europe. And what were they? Paris saw the largest exodus. The French city lost 7,000 or 6 percent of its millionaires, followed by Rome, which lost 5,000 or 7 percent of their millionaires. What is it that millionaires fear? Losing their millions, right? Have you ever heard of the handwriting on the wall? Now maybe they see the handwriting on the wall, but now you have seen the handwriting on the wall. Right here. How could the little lady, 150 years before all of this, say, there are too many who have the lingering spirit of Lot? How could she say there are those who could have left but didn't and now they want to leave but can't? I'll tell you this. I spoke with a gentleman, not of our faith, but a Christian. I spoke with a gentleman of means in the last two weeks. I didn't bring the subject up. He brought the subject up. He said, I don't know about you, but when I can get my hands on my money, I'm leaving.
He said, I've seen the handwriting on the wall. Well, who knows what today will bring and tomorrow will bring. Who knows? The good Lord knows. But according to this author of the Red Books, we have a duty to know for ourselves what is the express will of God in these matters. So here it is. We pray. We pray. We pray. We pray. And when God decides to intervene and answer our prayers specifically and virtually immediately, then we better act. We, this is no time to be, you know. Now this is how God is going to work all of this out and more. We're going to write a new book of Acts. Amen. A new book. A far more complete book of Acts. Now are these the Acts of the Apostles? Or are they the Acts of the Holy Spirit? Come on. Holy Spirit. The answer is yes. Because the Apostles have given themselves and put themselves in position where the Holy Spirit can use them. What more can God ask than that? And that's what He's asking for each one of us, every one of us. Just be ready when the time comes because I have a plan. And if you want to cooperate and will cooperate, you're going to see things that cannot be written down or told. Yeah, I've seen it. I've experienced it. I know it. And it would be wonderful if every day was a miracle. Well, every day is a miracle. Or on the way to being a miracle. Every day. Well, so I'll say this at the close of the day, folks. Um, we gave you some DVDs, a CD in the midst. One is what you listen to, and the others are what you view. The one that you listen to, I know right now, as soon as you leave today, you're going to put it in the, DVD, the CD player in the car, and you're going to listen to it. Don't have a wreck, but just, you know, you're going to listen to it. And I pray you're going to be stirred by these messages. They're powerful. They're timely. What we want to do is grow the work. That's it. So when I began going through some of this material, and we began doing a little work, a little ex exploration on the internet, and we found out that there were survivable places in the state of Texas. Can you believe it? There were some places that seemed to be better suited than others. And I, if I could quote the little lady, she says, God has such places for His people if they will but inquire of heaven. I like that. I, I, I like that. I think that God is going to use you or me or us to help others who for some reason are not being exposed to the red books. For some reason, the church is silent regarding the conditions in the large cities. I am heart sickened to think that thousands, 60 to 70 percent of the Adventists in North America live in the large cities are too close to them. 60 to 70 percent. And to my knowledge, not a word is being spoken. Not a word. Well, why? I'll tell you what the pastor in Manhattan, New York did. He stood up in my meeting, a thousand people there. He stood up in my meeting in Manhattan, New York, and he shouted out to me, don't tell my people to leave the city. Hmm. That was an error on my part. I did not know they were his people.
I'm heart sick. And there are things that I would like to say and like for people and friends like you to say to family members and other people who are bound up for whatever reason, jobs, family, whatever. Why are you there? Well, because this is the only place I can find a job. Well, so be it. If you believe God can't open another door to you, so be it. I would ask, I would inquire if I were you. I would. We need your help. Financially, yes, of course. We need your prayers, your words of encouragement. If God delivers the books by the millions that we want, we're not only going to be mailing them through the postal service to every residential address. We want to give away books. We want to do double duty. We want to catch people when we can. Now George has been on one of the cameras back here. George has just come back from San Francisco. And I should have had George up here to tell you what the experience of a few friends turned out to be when we shipped. How many cases of books did we ship, George? I don't even remember. Yeah, a lot of books. We're gonna to go to San Francisco and give out books. What was the occasion at the time? What was it? Oh, that's right, the Super Bowl. Who can forget the Super Bowl? The Super Bowl was coming. And so we had friends, some from Louisiana, some from Alabama, some from, and we went there, they went there to give the books away. George, out of every 10 people who went by, how many books did you give away? One book, if you were lucky. Well, this just is not working. I guess I'm going to go home. <laughs> no, it indicates what happened at Sodom. Are you listening? It, it, the story is repeating. Tell them to get out of town because fire is coming. Don't want to hear it. Not interested. Sorry. Don't want it. Yeah, the homeless people will help you. Well, I want to thank you for coming today. Some of you have driven a great distance, and we appreciate you coming. We ask a genuine interest in your prayers. People call quite often, Brother Wheeling, just want you to know I'm praying for you. Oh, please don't stop. Sometimes life is so hectic. And the day so hectic, you can hardly pray for yourself. Don't stop, because what we're doing is important. So last Sabbath, and I close, the phone rang. And I answered the phone. There was a little lady on the line. She sounded maybe 60-ish, 70-ish, maybe more. She said, who is this? I said, you've called Inspiration Books, ma'am. I said, we, we distribute Christian literature. Well, you're the person I want to talk to. <laughs> she said, I have a book right here. I don't know where it came from. Do you know how I got this book? I said, no, ma'am, I don't know. You got the book. She said, I asked my son, did you bring this book home? No, mom, I don't know how I got here. She said, well, I, I just, I had to call. She said, I don't know how this book got here, but I've been reading it. And it's exactly the message I need for this time. Exactly what I need. You don't know how this book got here. I said, no, ma'am, I don't. I don't even know where you are. 
Well, I'm in Georgia. Was, I said, I'm, I'm sure someone wanted you to have a blessing in the book. Oh, she said, I'm blessed. God bless you. Don't you wish every call were that straightforward, that simple, that beautiful, that pleasant? Sometimes they call and say, I don't know where you got my name, but if you ever send another thing to my house, I'm calling the law. <laughs> and now you know why you didn't marry that person. <laughs> now you know why you don't live next door to that person. Now you know. Now you know a lot of things. A lot of things. I want to have prayer with you. I know you have family. I know you have Friends, I know you have circumstances. I know you do. You want to lift a hand and say, pray for me and my family, me and my needs? Yes. I'm going to kneel. You stay seated. Blessed Father in heaven, if ever there were a time when we were needy persons, this is the time. The world is spinning out of control. Men are losing their minds. People are losing their lives and their souls. The enemy is at work everywhere, everywhere he's at work. He knows he's running out of time. Help us to know he's running out of time. And so are we. We have a work to do. We have a message to share. It's a good message. It's a message of love and hope. It's a message that the kingdom of heaven is almost here. Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That has not happened yet, Father. That has not happened. Please fill this prayer full for Jesus' sake and ours. Work in the lives of these dear people. I thank you for their faithful witness wherever they are, whatever their circumstances. I thank you that they have made an effort to come from a distance and be here today. I ask you to bless them and their families. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the need, I ask you to fill it and meet it. We have so many who are sick, some dying of dread diseases, some in constant, never-ending pain. O oh Lord, bless. Hurry the day, hasten the day, when these things shall be no more. Until then, I pray that you will open the windows of heaven and pour out the blessing that we need so that we can print the books by the millions. No, by the hundreds of millions. We're ready. We ask you to be ready and send what we ask for and what we need if we meet again this side of the kingdom, we thank you and praise you. If we do not, then we'll meet on the other shore. Heaven is coming. Jesus is coming. Thank you for blessing each one of us so that we will see him come in the clouds of heaven. We'll be part of that throng who will shout, the king is coming. We've waited for him and he's here. Thank you for this day, the time we've had together, the thoughts, piece them together and put them together in our thinking, in our imaginations, in our minds, so that we can see exactly where we play into this great scene that is just before us, this great plan that must be worked out. I thank you and I praise you. And I ask you to bless every soul here and especially the hands that have been lifted heavenward you know our intimate needs. And I thank you for answering in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.